Thanks, everyone, and um, and good morning. And it's wonderful um, to be here. It's uh, it's a really important moment and an opportunity to look into the future. Now, um, what I'd like to do is just to give a little five-minute glimpse of. Uh, capturing a bit of what Carlos said, but also then um, some of the scientific verifications that we, uh, to put it a bit simple, that we actually got it right from the beginning. And this is, uh, but I'd like to just start by, by just making the, the point that, uh, that Carlos pointed out, that there were three fundamental scientific entry points that have been verified and amplified even further uh, as we speak of these 10 years. So the welcome to the Anthropocene entry point was a fundamental start, as Kalle pointed out, the planet boundary work. Today we know that we can even talk about a saturation point from 1990 onwards, where the cracks in the Earth resilience starts being more visible. Very important scientific advancements on the reference point of the desired state of the planet. We put that very early as the Holocene interglacial equilibrium state of the Earth system, verified time and time again through more recent research. And of course, that tipping points are real, that the whole resilience theory has now gone all the way across scales to really being verified. And I think what came out last week in the Ocean and Cryosphere report of the IPCC is, is, is quite, you know, I was just about to call, use the word devastating, actually, the, the conclusion that the West Antarctic ice shelf, with the high likelihood, has already crossed the threshold, committing all future generations to an inevitability of three meter sea level rise. So this is now verified part, taking us to the planetary boundaries. Kalle's point is absolutely fundamental. This is the next incremental step in science, standing on the shoulders of giants. This was the planetary boundary framework a way of taking the natural next scientific step. If it hadn't been us doing it, someone else would have done it. This was a maturity point we had reached. It's not really true that there was no review, by the way, in Nature. It was the first time Nature did a fully open wiki type review. They published for every boundary one paper review openly publicly on the Nature homepage. So it became a, an open um, debate already from the word go. This is, was actually how we illustrated it from the very beginning. This was the, the Telberg 2009 version of the planetary boundaries. You see the picture here of this man standing at Victoria Falls at a place you're not allowed to stand. That was how we used the pedagogic explanation of the difference between a boundary and a danger point. That, of course, there's a fence for all tourists, not allowing people to go all the way to this uh, uncertain, dynamic, complex, dangerous point, and that that was the difference between the boundary and the tipping point, with all the quantifications that then led us to the first paper, the second paper, the update, as you know. And I'd just like to give you a, a glimpse what I think are so important verifications of the concept. This is the most important one in my mind. This is the advancement of the IPCC assessments from the third assessment through the fourth to the fifth to the last column, which is the SR 1.5. This is average temperature rise on the y-axis here. You recognize these red embers diagrams, which is the risk of crossing thresholds and damaging states. Further to the left, you have changes in ecosystems. In the middle are the risk assessments for extreme weather events. But further to the right is the planetary boundary assessment. This is the risk assessment of large-scale discontinuities, crossing Earth system tipping points. And look at the trend line as science advances from 2001 to 2019. And right here is the planetary boundary publication how the risk pattern on large-scale discontinuities has gone down from 6 degrees in 2001 to between 2 and 3 degrees today. So the more we learn, the more Earth system science advances, the more reason for concern we have, and the larger scientific justification for a planetary boundary framework we have. So that is one very strong verification of the boundary framework. The work on the trajectories that we've been, many of us in the room, involved in, showing the tipping elements and how they're interconnected, another verification of this work. A third one is, of course, the conceptual recognition of the fact that we only have a glacial, interglacial limit cycle over the last three million years, and that we're now sliding out of this limit cycle. And the big question, do we have a planetary threshold at around two degrees Celsius warming? The hothouse Earth hypothesis is a further one. This was published just a few months back by colleagues at the Potsdam Institute, led by Matthew Willett. I think this is a phenomenal piece of verification of planetary boundary science. It's the most humbling graph I know. 
It doesn't look like a humbling graph, but believe me, it is. This is three million years on the x-axis, and its average temperature on Earth, deviating from pre-industrial level zero over the past three million years. It's the latest run of the climber model. In black, you have the proxy data of actual observations. And what it tells us is that the Earth system has never passed two degrees Celsius warming over the past three million years that it's been self-regulating between this incredibly narrow limit cycle of minus four ice age to plus two warm interglacial, in and out of Milankovic cycles, in and out of orbital forcing, but still the biosphere has been self-controlling the system so incredibly well that it stays within this narrow cycle. Can you get stronger proof of a planetary boundary framework? I doubt it. Well, actually, there was one paper that came out a bit later than this, which was the Burke et al. phenomenal geological paper showing 60 million years back temperature on Earth, showing how we're passing up towards this five degree point here in the IPCC scenarios. Here is the Holocene Garden of Eden, 11,000 years. You have the Milankovic cycles to one million years. This is where we're heading towards four degrees Celsius warming, as business as usual. But look at where we're winding back the climate clock if we reach this point. Not to one million years back, which is the most recent Milankovic series, not even three million years, but back to the Miocene 10 million years ago. So in 150 years, we're winding back the climate clock potentially to 10 million years. Another verification, we need something like planetary boundaries to guide our future. So it's not a surprise that we here with uh, Frédéric Moubari and the Albiaco team and the whole resilience team reconfigure the sustainable development goals to the wedding cake inspired by the planet boundary framework. Today we have the Earth Targets Network trying to set up a whole new science-based targets for planetary boundaries for business and cities. The Earth Commission is now constituted. For the first time we have a scientific IPCC type assessment mechanism for the planetary boundaries in the future. The whole world in 2050 is trying to explore transformation pathways to attain the sustainable development goals within planetary boundaries. And that means, in my mind, that one inspiring vision for us is to put the sustainable development goals within planetary boundaries as a pathway to redefine sustainable development, actually. Prosperity and equity within planetary boundaries, of course. That would be, in my mind, the vision for our navigation into the future of the Anthropocene. And looking forward to the dialogue today. Sorry, there we are. Thanks.